Uh, I, as Carol said, I've worked on this project now from the start to finish. It uh, started in about 2009, and uh, it just topped out July 2014, and we're finishing the cladding this month. On the, on the tower. So this was an early rendering of the, of the projects as it exists uh, and a photo of the site about three or four months ago. Uh, you see it's, it's 530 tall, 530 meter tall tower next and a kind of twin to the west tower uh, which is about 380 meters tall. So I thought today I would explain three of the big design focuses of the last five, six years as we evolved the, the project from start to finish. First of all, how it fits in the trajectory of our own firm's practice of, in supertalls, um, and in the kind of site as it exists, which is a, as a collection of supertalls in and of itself. The programmatic complexity of the project, I think at this point it probably is one of the most complex uh, supertalls ever constructed. It has, in terms of its program, it has both retail office, but also residential and hotel program. Um, and not to mention all of the sort of underground connections that feed into the project. And I want to talk a little bit about materiality. I, I always say it's the tallest terracotta building in the world, though the Guinness Book of World Records doesn't agree with me uh, for various technical reasons. But um, uh, so firstly, the evolution uh, of the super tall and to, this, to the site itself. Uh, itself. So uh, this shows you Hong Kong down here and the Pearl River Delta in general. Uh, this Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and then Guangzhou at the kind of heart of the Pearl River Delta. It's a city of about 15 million people, the largest city in the Pearl River Delta. Uh, but very much domestically focused um, up towards the mainland and the rest of Guangdong province. It's a map of Guangzhou showing the historic center of, of the city and then the new, uh, the new area here as the, as the city's been moving east towards Shenzhen. There's a series of new development uh, areas here first where our site is located and then down here now on the island which is being developed into a kind of high-tech hub. Um, so this is, this is a view from Arab did a very nice TV tower, which forms the, the end to this axis here, which runs north-south, um, and shows you the sort of historic fabric of Guangzhou, and then the new CBD area of which uh, our building is a part of. Uh, obviously, this was historic fabric, which has over time been uh, regenerated. <coughs> And so the densities, basically, the density that result from the building, the construction of these buildings is a sort of six or seven fold uh, density increase uh, on the site. This shows you that, that central spine, which I showed you a second ago, which is here, the historic fabric of Guangzhou here. And you see it's not simply uh, a north-south access from the tower up to the, what's well, called sitting tower here, but it also runs all the way down, almost half the distance of the Pearl River Delta towards Shenzhen. So quite a significant axis that we, that we we took pretty seriously. I think uh, Chris uh, Wilkinson was here earlier to show, to present the West Tower, which was here. He was part of the original team that designed um, not just the West Tower, but also the competition entry, which placed these two twin towers um, along that axis. Uh, that over time, as the West Tower was constructed, there were numerous other, uh, let's say, evolutions of his design and then uh, sort of departures from his design, and I think uh, over a series of competitions for the land, so uh, some of which we were part of, some of which we, we came later to, but this shows you um, from the kind of twinning, the original concept of these two twins, the sort of departure, these schemes that moved further and further away from the form of the original West Tower, and um, over time started getting taller as well. And so I was noting to Carol earlier, before we started talking, that um, it was almost five, over five years ago when we did the competition to win this project, which was a similar time in China's, um, let's say, eco uh, similar economic uh, situation to what China's experiencing now, which is to say that there's a real estate slowdown. And so, to, in order to entice the developers to bid on the land, the, the government started easing and relaxing the heights possible on the site, and people got more and more extravagant. And so, um, this notion of the twin started changing from one which was the same to one which was potentially different. And that's where we found ourselves in, two, in, in the middle of 2009, um, which was a departure from this very, uh, let's say, bisymmetrical axis with the two matching towers to something a little different. And so we were approached by uh, New World Development at the time as a large Hong Kong developer who was bidding on the land. We had been a part of, a, part of been looking at the site for various developers for a number of years. And they started, they started playing with the height. And uh, the idea was to show how 
uh, the, the, you could create two towers that were were different, but also uh, could create a kind of uh, composition. So this was the this was the very elegant West Tower. Arabs, what I think is one of the most beautiful uh, tel television antennas ever built. And then our, our building, which tried to be not just a copy of something, but a kind of play, play uh, in an arrangement with the, the tower. So we went from the twinning to something like this, won the competition, and, uh, and then we went straight to the groundbreaking. I was telling Carol, we, we won the competition. We were driving up to Shenzhen to do Ping On Tower, which I see in the background. And we're sort of called back down to the client's office to meet with the client. And then two weeks later, we were groundbreaking. So this is, I think, the fastest super tall ever built in the history of the world. It's uh, about five years, which you'll know from looking around the room, is a very, very ambitious project. And it was done in the context, of, as I said, of, of the shifting economic uh, world in China. So this was the site as we found it, with the single tower, West Tower, just having been completed. And uh, kind of our, our take on on that tower. There's also a number of other beautiful towers by SOM, Helmut Jan, and others that, that, are, uh, that kind of march on this access, uh, this park access towards Civic Tower. So we had done the ICC Tower, and we were kind of familiar with doing twins that were not identical twins, but related twins. Um, so ICC and IFC in Hong Kong. And that was really the point of departure for us, was how do we create a taller big brother to this West Tower without copying the form, without overwhelming the form. And so right from the beginning, Bill and I and others at KPF started playing with this notion of picking up, picking up very different sort of angles that played off of that relationship that, that worked with the, the TV tower, a sort of chiseled form. And uh, because it represented an increase in area from the original brief, uh, the, 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 the towers, and a complexity of program that hadn't existed in the, in the West Tower, we started setting back the form at various different stages of the building to, res to, uh, to respect the different changes in program. So this is the bottom 80, uh, 50 floors is office, uh, from 50 to like 85 is, is service apartment and then hotel at the top. So each of those setbacks in the chiseled form represented a shift in, in uh, program, which then we tried to, to angle the parapets to kind of re respond and react to the West Tower. So from all angles of the, it's a very unique super tall, because from all angles of the city, when you look at it, it looks like a different building. It doesn't have a kind of universal symmetry, which the West Tower does, to some extent does, and which Arab's Tower does as well. So there, there is the basic stacking diagram. It's uh, four zones of office, two zones of residential, and then the, the hotel at the top. And I, sh I should note, there's, a, there's a quite a sizable seven-story retail podium here and two stories of retail basement, uh, which I won't talk too much about in the, in the program, but which played heavily into, the, into how the, the podium reacted with the tower. And we won the scheme on a basic, I think we won the scheme on a basic premise, which was that we were going to make the most efficient floor play for each of the program types. So you see here a diagram of the floor play types as they go up the building. Uh, corresponding to the to, to the structural systems as well. So this is the office, which is essentially the same structural system as our ICC tower, which is a mega column scheme, eight mega columns with the center core. It then sets back for the residential. We get thinner floor plates for the resi, and then on top you get hotel, which is the sort of which is kind of where you want the smallest floor plates and, and the best views. So very simple structural structural solution to what what could have been a very complicated project problem. And I said I was going to talk about the evolution of, of the super tall within our office. This is a map of, or a chart of some of the super talls now under construction around the world. And you see highlighted in the dark gray some of the work of KPF. And uh, the building figure is kind of right sort of in the middle here between ICC and Shanghai World Financial Center and some of our taller buildings like Lotte and Pingong. And we learned a little bit from doing these other projects uh, that some of, some of the things we learned from doing these other projects we applied to the, to the tower. I said that, the, that, that we stepped back the tower. In the Shanghai World Financial Center, which was office and hotel at the top, we, we, we sculpted the tower to react to the different pro the requirements of the program and the floor plans. So as you march up the building, it goes from what, what is a very s sort of uh, conventional center core building to one where you see in the blue with the, with the hotel floor plates, a much narrower floor plate. But the building on its exterior is, a, is an expression of the programmatic changes taking place inside of the, inside of the tower. 
So here you see the typical office to the typical hotel. And it results in some quite exquisite spaces. The ICC Tower was almost the polar opposite of what we did at Shanghai World Financial Center. So as I said, it's a mega column scheme. It's eight mega columns. It goes all, marches all the way up fairly regularly as a square floor play. There's, again, zones of office with a hotel on the top. In this case, um, the expression was, was just really, really limited to both the facade, the actual facade of what we call the shingle wall at ICC, but also how it terminated at the base. And the, and the extrusion of the tower is relatively simple. Here you see the, the zones of office with the hotel at the top. And the hotel is it's the same floor plate as the office, we just call it out the middle, similar to what, what uh, they did at the West Tower. So there you see the, the eight mega columns, the center core, uh, a plan that, that became the kind of progenitor for what we were working on in Guangzhou. Again, Lote, which came after Guangzhou's design, similar, similar and even more complexity. So Guangzhou figures somewhere in the lineage of those buildings between ICC and, and Lote as this idea of creating a city and has influenced some of the buildings we're doing now in New York. Uh, this is one Vanderbilt with the sort of stepped terraces, terrace top, or Hudson Yards, uh, where we're adding com complex programs to the top of the tower and outdoor space for the first time, really in, in some of the design. So I'll show you later uh, the outdoor, the, what I consider to be one of the bigger aspects of the Guangzhou Tower, which is the, all the integration of the outside space, which I think is really, really unique in, in super tall construction and is finding its way now into more and more of our work within the office. So we're, we're finding that Guang, Guangzhou is on the sort of scale of these buildings in height, but it's also on a scale of complexity, which doesn't necessarily correspond to height. And at the time in our office, I think it was the most complicated mixed-use tower we'd ever undertaken. Uh, certainly, Lote is, I think, surpassing it now in terms of that complexity. But at the time, it was a, it was a very challenging project. So I saw earlier there's something like 76 elevators in the West Tower, and we're at seven, just under 70 elevators in the East Tower with more area. So that was another challenge, was how do you design a super efficient core? This is a diagram of the, of the original elevator scheme, and I just want to include it just so, you, so I can walk you through how the elevator works, because some of you may know and it's, this has gotten more press than any of the architecture, but it has the world's fastest elevator in the world. So, uh, It's four zones of office, so there's two local zones of office, and a, sh a sky shuttle, which takes you from the lobby straight up to the sky lobby here, where you transfer into two more zones of office. The hotel, the hotel uh, shuttle from the ground floor takes you straight up to the hotel lobby at like 87, I think, or not 88 floor. And that's the, that's the fastest elevator in the world. There's no stops between here and here. And then you transfer to local elevators. And the interesting, I think one of the more interesting uh, parts of the building is the elevator and the scheme for the residential, which takes you in a shuttle to the sky lobby for the residential and then has individual lifts, breaks off into something like 12 or 13 individual lifts, which take you straight into your units on the floor. So each of the programs not only each of the, you can see each of these zones not only is, uh, reflects the individual programs through the structure and through the floor plate size, but also through the elevator strategy. But before we get into the, the tower, I'll take you through kind of a zone by zone in the tower. I just wanted to return to the original master plan, which is this sort of linear park, which runs actually north south. It's turned on this page just to show detail. This, this is the Arab uh, TV tower, observation tower. Uh, these are the, this is the West Tower, the East Tower, and then a series of towers which march along this park all the way up to the uh, stadium and then eventually to the, to the train station. Uh, but underneath this park is a pretty robust shopping mall, essentially, which takes you from the, from the river all the way up to that stadium, two levels of, of retail, uh, a people mover, and then parking, bus stations, and crisscrossing that crisscrossing that long linear basement are a series of subway lines which feed into, the, feed into that mall at certain points. So um, again, this is a diagram of how our ICC tower went, uh, kind of fed back into the network of subway stations in Hong Kong. And our, our Guangzhou tower does much the same thing. So we find ourselves down here in the East Tower along this, along this retail concourse, you see it goes here, it dips down below highways, it comes back up, it dips down below bus stations. It's really a piece of robust urban infrastructure. So I think the tendency 
in the West is to look at something like look at something like that master plan from above and say that that's not great urbanism. But when you look at what's happening underneath, you see the kind of complexity that planners are dealing with and the kind of population that they're planning for. So at any one time, our tower will have something like 30,000 people inside of it, living, working, eating, um, shopping. And so how most of those people will be arriving at the B2 level, not at the ground floor, not on level two, but in, in the basement. So for us, the the design started in the basement like a tree you know, and, and really worked its way up to the to the top of the tower, the expression you, of the top of the tower. Are you connected to the fast drain from Hong Kong directly into the tower? When we started designing it, we thought we were. We thought it would be possible actually to take a train from our Hong Kong ICC tower to our Ping An tower to our Guangzhou mm -hmm. tower, which was we, here. And then later it was moved because the the, the density of the population was such that we had to, they had to move it somewhere else. But there is a train station here at the top which is serving the regional. We can go to Beijing from there. Um, so yeah, it would be possible to get off of the train and move and work, work your way down here. There's also a number of subway lines that crisscross the site. And then we designed a series of bridges that connect in at upper levels, um, each of which is a little different, to connect over the parks and over these um, underpasses. So this is a ground floor plan. As I said, there's a, there's a pretty robust piece of retail here, but I really wanted to focus the discussion on the tower, given the venue. Um, so just to give you a brief orientation, the park is here, north-south. Office lobby here, which are double-decker elevators. Uh, residential here, and hotel lobby here at the south. So we zoom in on the, on the office lobby. As I said, there's, there's two <laughs> banks of local lifts and a, and a bank of six uh, shuttle elevators, they're double deck lifts. So half the people come in at the ground floor, half the people go up escalators to level two, which is similar to how we did the elevators in, in Hong Kong and ICC. And one of the reasons we can limit the amount of elevator shafts. Uh, you come in off, off the street or up from the corners from the basement into the lobby. This the expression of the two lift banks here, the double deck lifts. Um, and then from the street, relatively calm, rel relatively a pastoral landscape because really we're not expecting too many people to arrive that way. Um, there's a small post office at the ground floor as well. This is a, a plan of the, of the shuttle lifts, which come up here, transfer into these two zones and keep moving. There's a, there's a club house and some leasable space. Again, those are all double decks, so if you're coming up in the top elevator bank, you would then transfer to the top local elevator bank and keep going and the kind of mixing space of that, of that um, sky lobby. And then the typical plan, as I said, a kind of derivative of the ICC tower with the eight mega columns and smaller columns in between. Interestingly, the ICC mega columns are about a half of the size, even a third of the size of these mega columns. China has a seismic code, which is uh, pan China. So even though they get only earthquakes in northern China and Beijing, Tianjin, the earthquake code in Beijing applies to Guangzhou. So even though Guangzhou and, and, and Ping An are within eyesight of ICC Tower, they have a totally different code which dictates the structure gets larger, which in essence actually helped us with the construction speed because it was a, it was a less um, it was kind of brute force structural system over, over structured. Um, and then the inside views uh, looking towards the TV Tower and from individual, individual offices. So that takes you up, the office takes you up to about here, uh, where you then, from here to this setback is residential, as I said. So just to recap, the residential, you come in at the ground floor, you come into this clubhouse, and then from there to these individual lifts, which take you to your, your own units. So um, at every major setback, it's public space, it's outdoor space. And so you would come in here, and then you transfer to these these lifts, which then take you straight up. And the concept was a, was a pretty simple one. Because the elevators are, again, this is, you have to remember back to like 2009, the, the elevators are free GFA, the elevator shafts are free, that you can deduct the area. So there's really no cost economic penalty for building more elevators except for the cost of the lift cap and the shaft. So, our very savvy Hong Kong developer said, well, I might as well provide this as an amenity to my residents if they have to transfer their, transferring into their own elevator. So we littered the floor plan, the perimeter of the floor plan with these elevators. So you could come up and come straight into your unit from those, from those lifts. 
they, this central bank of elevators here connects to the amenity space, the spa amenity space of the hotel above. And the idea was to create villas in the sky, a very simple idea. This was some of the original concepting we did for the scheme where you would come in and into your own courtyard from your elevator and then, sh and then move into your, into your duplex. That's now been implemented, um, a rendering of the, of the inside. It's not done by us, um, by a Hong Kong interior designer. Um, and then to the hotel, the hotel has its own dedicated drop off under undercover Port Cochere and come into another four sky shuttles which take you up to the lobby. It's a very similar, similar plan. You come into the lobby space here, lobby restaurant facing the view, and then an outdoor terrace here, which also has a large skylight for the pool below, double height pool below uh, with operable skylight. And then as I said, the floor plan is extremely efficient. It's really designed uh, to maximize, maximize the frontage along this nicer view, which is towards, uh, towards the southwest. So that setback, which you saw, which you saw in the rendering, is here um, at the lobby floor. And then the top of the tower has a series of, uh, of terraces, three levels of outdoor terraces. So you can actually go outside. The bottom level is a restaurant, a middle level club, and the top is a ballroom. So here you see the ballroom here, a small restaurant here with, this, with the shuttles which take you out. But really, I think for the first time, you'll be able to go outside at a level about 510, if I remember correctly, um, 510 meters, and see the city, look out over the city. And so the, one, of the, one of the benefits of that chiseled uh, parapet is the wind protection. And I was telling Carol, it's, it's amazing to be up there. I was up there a month ago. And you see the clouds moving literally through your head, but you feel nothing. Mm -hmm. You feel the moisture of the clouds, but you literally feel not, no air movement. So it's a happy byproduct. The parapet, the parapet created sort of a happy byproduct where you could go outside and not, not be affected by the wind. The third thing I want to talk about was the materiality of the facade. Um, it's terracotta, and it was designed um, as a kind of counterpoint to some of the facades that were already uh, constructed or under construction in Guangzhou, in this area of Guangzhou at the time. Ours, our tower was one of the last towers to be built in this district. So that's what meant done a very handsome glass tower here. This is the Helmut Jan Litop Plaza, which is a beautiful fritted uh, sawtooth facade. And then the West Tower, which was a, a dark, sort of dark glass um, vessel. And so uh, we wanted to lighten up the facades, which, which were already built. and. And one way to do this in China, if you work in China, you know the reflectivity requirements are so high that you often end up with very dark glass. So we suggested to the client to introduce uh, a different material on the facade. And so we, this is a, a photo of the mock-up, but it's now being built on site. We introduced these terracotta panels to the facade. It crackled glazed terracotta, which reflected the sort of origin of the family, the family's business. and. Uh, provided a little lightness and brightness on the, on the wall when viewed from away. It also happens to be a material that's always been used in super talls. Um, and so a lot of the time and energy of the team went into figuring out how to, to fasten terracotta at this height with these types of wind loads. Um, and to the client's credit, actually pay for and build and, and fabricate the terracotta. So another thing we did is, this is, this is a pretty crude diagram, but this is a terracotta panel here, um, and then we introduced an operable panel here with a vent. So there are no operable glazed units, but for the first time, I think, in Super Hall, you'll be able to actually open a window as a user in a, in a hotel room or a user in a residential or office space. So that vent is a, is a meshed vent with louvers in front, and then this is an anodized aluminum fin which protects the vent from, uh, from wind, so it doesn't whistle when, when you open it. So that's, this is a view from the office looking out. This is that dark metal panel, which will be operable. And the white metal here is simply uh, receiving the terracotta on the outside. And the very simple, it's a very, very simple facade. It does shift, you can see, as you move up the terracotta angles, as you move up, which will affect how it catches the light at night. And sometimes you actually even notice it during the day. It just takes the light a little different. So here's the, the fastening detail here as a, as a kind of typical detail with the terracotta, the vent, the louvers protecting the vent, the vent here, and then 
starting to introduce lighting, an LED light, which, which appears here and lights up this area of the LED. Because the building's so high, really, floodlights only have minimal effect. So we needed to introduce from that fin a light that would light the, L the terracotta. And there's some of the, the glaze process. We spent a lot of time actually in Germany in the beginning and then in China, um, actually with the kind of glazing process to make sure it was pollution resistant, and, uh, which was a big deal. And then um, also had, the kind of, had a kind of enough of a crackle when you saw it from the inside, it looked authentic. Some of the fabrication process. And then, a mo and then a series of mock-ups over and over again to kind of perfect these details and these interchange details. Essentially, the, the terracotta is hollow, and we ran, we fastened it at the top and the bottom of the panels, and you run metal cords through the panel, through the, in, through the hollow chambers of the terracotta, so that when, it, when you hit it, if a gondola, a cleaning gondola hit it, or some debris and a, and a and typhoon hit it, the, the terracotta would crack, but it wouldn't shatter, kind of like safety glass. So that's, that's what it looks like now. That's the terracotta, the operable panel, which is hidden, which we, which we wanted to hide because we didn't want it to be too dark, and then the anodized. And one of the interesting things, we, we probably, if you're architects, you go through this all the time, but the, trying to convince a client to pay for terracotta, which was more expensive than metal. And we had to stand at the mock-up, mock-up after mock-up with all the client groups to, to show them how, how the light, how the, how the terracotta took light differently than the metal. And it really, it really does when you see it's a kind of uh, flatness which you can't replicate in, in metal. And then there's some of the lighting details as we developed it. Um, and the lighting concept, which you can't see now on site, but is coming soon, which will reinfo reinforce the kind of chisel top. And so the lighting really becomes integral to the, to the form and plays off the other two more robust lighting, colorful lighting systems of the West Tower and the TV Tower. And ours hopefully will be a, a more white uh, finish. Uh, and you see kind of hints of it, but the... Uh, that we've also introduced small LEDs into the, t the top of the tower at these, at these setbacks, which will twinkle. Which, if you know, our client is Chao Tai. If, if you know Chao Tai Fook, you know it's sort of like the Tiffany's of, of China. So the idea was to create a building during day which reflected the, the uh, sort of history and legacy of the company and of China, and then at night reflected the kind of ambitions of the, of the company without putting a big ring on the top. <laughs> or one big bright light. So that's the idea. Um, it's a very dynamic skyline at night, and hopefully our, our tower will um, blend in and reinforce that. Um, and then a photo of the site uh, from a, about a week ago. So it's now, it's now topped off. So that basically is a sort of summary of the tower. I thought, I, I didn't talk about, the, talk about it at the, um, in the talk, but I, some of the issues which I think well, were brought up during this process in which we're resolving in through the design and subsequent designs in our office was this, in, this interesting um, dialogue between podium and tower in all of our ta in all our buildings because this tower you know you see in the, you see on the walls here they always see this tower but there's always often a, a component of retail or other pro public program that gets kind of slammed into the tower uh, which was a challenge on this project and is often a challenge on many of our projects I think the core was an interesting kind of thing we could talk about if you wanted to talk about that. Um, how to squeeze functionality out of a core, which was re relatively small, efficient core, given what was going on. Um, the outdoor spaces, as I said, really proud of those. I think they'll be really, really special. And then I think as architects in the room, this idea of adding materiality to what is, in my opinion, a, a very glassy typology, or has become a very glass, glass and metal typology. And, I'd be happy to talk about our ideas. You can, you can probably imagine we went through many, many materials before we settled on terracotta. Um, so, that's it. Like who brought up this idea first? Is KPF or is uh, the Sun Consultant or I am? 
We typically, well in this case we, we brought it up, we typically we start working with the taxon later in later phases of the, uh, of the project. Uh, you'll, you'll know if you work in China that there's an operable requires a fresh air requirement, which is challenging in the super tall because you really can't open windows at that height yeah. and get whistling and all sorts of problems. So um, it was something that we had been thinking about in other projects. Um, we, we finished a project which I didn't show you called Hyson Place in Hong Kong with operable vents horizontally laid out. And so we, did, we were just in the studio one day and we just flipped them sideways and said, oh, that's an idea. And then over time, through the deep through the design process, it got refined and flattened and kind of streamlined into that um, into that system. And one of the, one of the things about that system is it's all it's not it's you can imagine we spent a lot of time figuring out if it should be automated or 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 done with the individual. And in the end, we went with the individual. We had that flexibility. I think the hotel operators will probably keep the windows locked. I suspect the office will not, and the residential won't. So. Um, but it, is, it was a really, really fun part of the process, and it was, it was fun from a functional point of view. It was also fun from a lighting point of view because that cavity allowed us to do a lot of fun things with the lights. I think the lighting at this project is going to be really, really special because of that. How does it affect, affect the, uh, the temperature inside? Uh, well, it's all automated. So all of the, the ceiling systems are fully automated. Okay. So you open a window, you'll be able to know. You'll be able to know. But again, I think, and I think this is something that's maybe a little different from some of the other firms on the wall. Is we uh, are, are like let's call it like automation or technical, the technical side of our design is really um, in the service of the architectural design. It's not a, it's not a generator of design ideas. So we incorporate when we can, and we ignore when we don't, when it doesn't fit our design. But it's not a, it's you know there are a lot of other towers in that area that are. That are part of that are derivative of those ideas, and um, this was certainly not that. Yeah. yeah. Like the wind tunnel one. Right? Yeah, it's very. It's like it, yeah, the wind tunnel one. There's another and other ones that as well. How many can you use of the hotel? It, I think it'll be about two hundred, just maybe two seventy five. How about the rest of the unit types? Uh, there are there are one bedroom. Uh, there are studios and one bedrooms, which make up the majority, and then the two bedroom villa that I showed you are the top, the top zone, and then the three bedrooms at the corner, at the tip, this kind of prow of the mm -hmm. building, and that's where the three bedrooms ended up. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a fairly even split, I, I think it's probably 20, 20, 30, or 30, 30, 30 20, 10, or something mm -hmm. like that. So from one bedroom to like, like two bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. And do um, um, you mind? a little bit more about the uh, uh, coordination experience. I mean, obviously you guys have a very experience in Asian Pacific those market, but mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure, for example, for the hotel, mm -hmm. do, um, whether uh, the hotel will be operated by uh, other party that they have sort of the uh, design team to, you know, because normally if the hotel is operated by like a star and they may, they might have some of their yeah, so all of the interiors were done. We, we, in this case, we did the interior design of the office, um, but the retail design was done by a, by a different designer. The residential design was done by a different designer, and yeah. the hotel ID was done by um, Yellow Pushover out of Toronto, mm -hmm. and Super Potato did the restaurant outlet. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think one of the challenges of doing a super tall, like a mixed use super tall, mm -hmm. is that you're, you have to coordinate all of these different consultants yeah. all at once. And so, you know, we've done many, many mixed use projects with Hunji Hills, Landmark. We've done a, num a number of these complicated multi-building mixed use projects in Asia, but never in a single elevator ship like core. Mm -hmm. And so that, that presents challenges and if the team is not marching in the same direction. So like, for, let me give you an example. So in a hotel, yeah. if you start designing a standalone hotel or a hotel that's part of a mixed use complex, yeah. um, you often bring the, the hotel designer in, in at the late, SD or early DD stages at, at the point in which the hotel modules are set, the planning is set, but oftentimes the hotel designer comes in and flips it on its head. Mm -hmm. In this case, we really couldn't because the structure was, was actually being um, piled mm -hmm. when they got on board. So it was, they were kind of stuck with the module. And I think Yellow Fisher did a great job of taking, taking what we had done, the basic assumptions we had done, and pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, but not turning it on its head. So one of the disadvantages of having a super tall like this is you really, 
if you want flexibility in planning, you, you can't do that in the later phases. The elevator cores were set. <laughs> yeah. You're you're designing, you're building the core at the ground at the basement when you're designing rooms up above. The same about the same time. But the, the bit about that you said about the um, elevators in the service departments not counting as mm -hmm. the gross floor area, mm -hmm. you know, by code, was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, you had a lot of interior space that um, wasn't well, could, um, wasn't premium space. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, I mean that go back to the um, situation in as well not comparable. New York is not comparable to anything in a lot of ways. But the super slender ultra luxury towers are really predicated on a really contracted yeah. core. No, you know, two elevators yeah. and eighty stories. And um, the idea that you mentioned is that you step out of a private elevator into your apartment. Mm -hmm. It means that um, the buyer is paying for every square foot. Yeah. And the seller, um, you know, is, yeah. is taking taking money for every square foot. Yeah, well, you could see, because the core was taking up so much of the space, because the core, it, it's interesting, because if you're the hotel operator, you look at this plan, half the plan you don't control. It's all, it's all if you're, sorry, if you're the residential operator, half the stuff is just going up to the hotel, right? So it was, once we started adding the, if you put a traditional perimeter, like two and a half meter, two meter corridor around the core, you're you're just limiting the leasing span. So, the benefit of this was there is a there is a there is a perimeter hallway that goes around for fire egress and serp, you know, moving in your piano and stuff. But it's a 1.2 meter corridor. It's extremely narrow, and so they, there's really not a lot of public space that you're having to build or construct as the owner. It's it's because this looks nuts. <laughs> it looks yeah, crazy. It, it looks like it looks like chaos, explained. but it's like yeah. a Hong Kong yeah. developer mm -hmm. kind of like logic mm -hmm. uh, applied to Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we thought it was very interesting. Actually it's starting to inform a lot of the work we're doing in the super super slenders and other other places. In terms of the uh, individual elevators um, banks um, it's just one elevator services each apartment. Uh, there's, there's sometimes it depends on the unit type, and this is a, obviously an early sketch for clarity. But what ended up happening is some, like a two bedrooms will share, so you'll come out into a vestibule and you'll share something like, well, this is actually not. Now what happens is you come out, either go, yeah, you go this way to one or this way to the other. So there's two doors in the elevator. Um, the, the, these ones, the single ones, the efficient ones, uh, will share a couple of elevators with a small vestibule, like almost like a small Hong Kong style standalone tower. And then some of the units have their own elevators. So at most you're sharing with you know twenty other people because of the because of the floors. So basically, if one of them breaks down, you could use the center. You go here, and that was the advantage of. Be um, this this stacks on for various reasons. This, this had to be here, and it stacks on top of the hotel. So it kind of had to be there, so it just kind of dragged it down with no cost. It was otherwise would have just been a void. Um, so on the lowest level, um, the structure must be reinforced for punching shear as well. Yeah, you have to ask. A, I suspect okay. you have to ask someone professional, <laughs> not like myself. Yeah. But it was the core. The core is. A, I mean, you saw the, the plan. It's a really robust. This is like. Twice what you need in Guangzhou core. I mean, it's enormous, absolutely enormous. Um, in the description of the seminar, was it written that it, it has a breathing facade? So yeah, it's the operable, the operable vents. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, so it's basically you just trying to ventilate air into the building. Yeah, it's a requirement of code of Chinese code to have operable windows, um, and a certain percentage of the facade has to be operable by code. Okay. What ends up happening is two things: one, you build the operable windows and the owner locks them, okay. or two, you build the operable windows and everyone leaves them open, and so you go through <laughs> you go through Guangzhou or Shenzhen and all these <laughs> all these things and are like open or half open and form them. So our intent was to not have that situation, <laughs> was to avoid. Either having them closed and not be able to like have some fresh air in your apartment, yes. or to have them always be open and to look like bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
You mentioned some challenges with the podium. Mm -hmm. uh, are those just in terms of programming or structure? No, I think it's programmatic because what, what ends up, so designing a retail podium is sort of like the opposite of designing super tall. You design everything at the last minute. And the super tall, you design every, designing super tall is like traveling with your family. It's like you have to pack everything two days in advance. And then the, the, the retail podium is like, everything just comes together at the last minute. So there's a couple of ways to deal with it. So like our Shanghai World Financial Center, the tower comes down and the, and the retail goes around the tower. That's kind of a separate thing. The same thing is true of Lotte. I might be able to model it here. It's really detached from, from the tower. And our ICC tower, the tower comes down and hits, it literally sits on the retail podium. Mm -hmm. And so what we attempted to do here was to kind of create a hybrid where there was enough separation. There's, if you remember the plan, there was a, there was an atrium that ran straight through east-west across it. So the atrium formed a kind of separation and then the facade system of the podium could be totally different. Um, but it's a challenge because you're having to over plan things when, you know, in 2010, for the core, for the hotel, it leaves things super vague in 2014 for the retail. And I do think that's like a, that's a challenge with the, with the super tall. But, you know, we briefly explored, when we started the competition, we briefly explored two towers on the site and the cost of all those cores coming down it was one of the few instances where I'd say actually super tall, the economics of super tall made sense. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it's like Carol, we designed it in 2009 right after Lehman collapsed and China was going through this kind of weird moment where we didn't know what was gonna happen. And now we're kind of in that same moment in China where there's a level of restraint, let's call it development restraint. Mm -hmm. And the tower is sort of in vogue now because it's, because it's sufficient and it's pretty simple. So people are responding really well to it now in China precisely because of those kinds of efficiencies. Um, and another thing, who, who was the materials consultant for, or for the facade? Things like the facade? Well, we ended, we have a kernel, off, we have an exterior wall consultant. In this mm -hmm. case, it was a company called ALT out of Manila, the Philippines. Um, but the material came from all over the place. So John Ho was the uh, kernel wall manufacturer with terracotta that started in Germany and then actually was produced in China. So it's kind of all over the place. Okay. What's the size of the main columns of the base? And is there an outrigger system? There's an outrigger system. If we go back to the section, the, the, at the lobby, you'll see at the lobby, if I go back to there. Yeah, so here it's about, it's about four and a half by not, uh, eight, I think, at the very bottom, including the clad. It's huge. It's like a room, basically. Including clad. Yeah. And uh, the, I mean, it's just, it's just totally enormous. And you can see, actually, you start to see it here. It's, it's concrete. It's basically concrete plates, then, or sorry, steel plates, then filled with concrete. So it's, it's nuts. And do you know if that was controlled by wind or by the, you said that the seismic requirement there is, is too stringent. The seismic dictated, the, the seismic really quickly, and we assumed when we did the competition that we would end up with a mega column. And then the size, and then quickly, then when we when we awarded the project, started working with Arab, it quickly became apparent that that was the most efficient way to, to d deal with the tower of this height. Um, we would have just we would have just had way too many co big columns in the office plate to mm -hmm. do anything else. But it's a combination of wind and, and you can imagine a tower like this goes through a number of wind tunnel studies. Yep. Yeah. As well. Which Arab office were you guys working? Hong Kong. Do you have a damper on the top? No damper. Okay. No damper. Which is another reason the tower is really stiff. It's a really, really stiff tower. And is it heavy because the terracotta? My point of reference for terracotta <laughs> is no, the no. Woolworth building. No, no, and no. The, the terracotta is like did. totally. It's totally. Um, you can like pick it up. It's a. It's a wonderful. It turned out to be a wonderful material. It's. It's hall. I mean, it's. I. We're doing the Ping'an Tower with stone. We're doing a number of towers now with stone. And as a natural material, I think terracotta is a much more pliable material. One, because you can glaze it. So you basically clean it like aluminum. And in some cases, it's actually better than aluminum. It takes, it takes cleaning better than aluminum. Um, and it's not that heavy. Well, 
when they did the Woolworth building a number of years ago, um, it was enormously yeah. heavy, right? Um, so I, I guess there have been some Well, you see the hollow, the hollow channels. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's heavy. It's, it's heavier, heavier than aluminum. That as well. But I would think that actually the heaviness might, might be an advantage in the um, stiffness of the... I was going to show you, I was going to bring a video, and then I was advised <laughs> not to, of uh, the testing of the terracotta, where we would take these giant things and just slam it with all of them, like car parts, basically, just slam it repeatedly mm -hmm. over and over again to make sure it didn't break. And there was a moment in the testing where we had to actually increase the, increase some of the thicknesses of the terracotta, but I think it's, and it survived, it's the fastest constructed super tall in the world, and the way that they constructed it, I think, shows. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. there, there's, a, there's a kind of, um, toughness to the way that they brought the panels up, hoisted them up, and, and built, that took a number of those panels out in the process. Um, but it survived now four typhoons with no damage. So the only damage they've had is contractors. No, no wind or no natural. Well, that was the case in the Woolworth building. But actually, the problem with Woolworth is the joints. What mm -hmm. do you do with the joints? So what did they do? We exposed the joints. They're totally 100% exposed. So um, the big joints, there's uh, at the curtain wall, I'm remembering this correctly, at the unitized, it's all unitized, so at the unit joint, I think it's a 20 mm um, reveal that gets capped, but everywhere else it's exposed. It's like a 5 mm exposed, unglazed. Do you have a question? I remember hearing somewhere that the Chinese building could have made it stone above a certain height. Um, I guess I, I'm, like, I'm curious how the authorities reacted when it was going to be terracotta this way. Well, it depends which authority you're talking about. The mayor loves it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. That the, I don't know that like the. I, yeah, I think it's. I, I had. I think that I know that that's was the case. I'm not sure that that's still the case because I remember we encountered that with Pangon, where we had to we had to cap the stone in a certain place. Um, but it wasn't. It was considered a process material for this project. You mentioned that Arup was a structural engineer. Who were uh, some of the other major consultants, like the elevator? Elevator, Jim Fortune did the elevator design. Um, and we had two architects. We had one that started and one that finished, a local architect. Uh, so we finished with LNO out of Hong Kong. And there was a local LDI involved. Uh, PB did some of the lifting and some of the mechanical systems as well. Um, and then, land bear, you know, as I said, various a lot of interior designers, a lot of landscape designers. Um, you can imagine all the different levels and all the fun that they had. Um, some retail, Calson did the retail interior concept thing. I think I give credit to everyone. I think that's about. I think that's everyone. Yeah. How specific was the client about what what they wanted at the top, for example, since? Um, well, we won, so we won the competition. The, the top was the residential, and the middle was the hotel. And through the and actually we, we did the groundbreaking with the top being residential and the bottom and the middle being hotel. And then over the course of the project, I think they got more GFA, <coughs> and so they were able to extend. They were able to pad out the thing. So actually, the residential became more. One of these we flipped was just a bigger floor plate for the residential. Um, and then the, the, the question of the observation deck was, uh, was an interesting one uh, because we were pushing for it, obviously, given our experience at ICC and Shangri-La Financial Center. We think it's nice to bring public space to the top of the tower. Um, and the hotel operator was just, just no way. They just weren't interested in giving up the view. So in the end, we settled for the public, this sort of bar, uh, indoor outdoor spaces of the bars and restaurants. But at that point, you're kind of like above, I mean, I, I've been up there and you're above everything. <laughs> you're looking down on the West Tower, you see the, it just looks like a small building. So it's kind of, at that point, you're like above, you're in an airplane. Is that actually public space or do you have to be an employee of the office? No, the office people, they can't get to it. It's a hotel. So the hotel guests can go and if you go for a drink, you can go. Or it's actually one of the big secrets of the Shanghai World Financial Center. You can go have a drink <laughs> at the top of the hotel, get the same view as the observation deck for less money and you get more gin tonic. So that's that kind of concept. 
Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, you said uh, they have a groundwork right after, two weeks after you made the design. Yeah. So the excavation the foundation is being like coming around and you need to do a design. Is there any point there were any delays uh, because the excavation goes so far along and you didn't catch up with your design, something like that? Not us. We were always on time. <laughs> there are other people who were late. The, um, I'm trying to remember, there was a delay, there was a construction delay, which had to, I, I'm sure you maybe you know, in China there are all these like games, like events, and then during that period they stop all construction. And there was a lengthy, it's like the East Asian Games or Southeast Asian Games or something where we really couldn't build for like six months and that caused a lot of delay, but also allowed us to catch up, um, a lot of the consultants to catch up because the, the, I mean they were, they were just, I mean they were excavating the next day. They were, they were really, I mean I've never seen anything like it in our office ever. Um, so that, we were sort of happy that the, Games came to town. In that case, it's a good problem. Yeah, it's a good problem to have. Is the Beijing Tower, the Chinese one, is that mm. um, terracotta? Does that use terracotta also? I think so. Uh, are you seeing any legacy or influence? Yeah, we're seeing. We're, well, one, I showed you the picture of one Vanderbilt, which will be a terracotta, terracotta spandrel. Um, there are, we hope, there are, um, and there are other applications of it. We actually used it on a few buildings in Beijing before we did this project. And so I think this project has really like opened the doors for how tall we can go with the terracotta. So I'm excited to see it on one grand ball. I, I see it in our designs now on projects that are on the boards right now. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it will become one yeah, of the things that our firm is, you know, like we have within our firm, like the shingled wall is like a thing. And we have all that. You saw it go from ICC now to Hudson Yards. And I think you're seeing a similar kind of terracotta thing start innovation in China and move back to New York with, mm -hmm. with one kind of a... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so a kind of historical observation that uh, the characteristic form from about 2000 to maybe 2010 or so mm -hmm. would be the floor to ceiling glass, mm -hmm. from, you know, ubiquitous. Yeah. So, um, so it's interesting that, mm -hmm. you know, that Styles that and is totally changed. That's totally changed. That's totally Because what happens is, if you, if I just find you a skyline picture, one of the things is everyone went to this all glass, all glass aesthetic, and it makes because of the reflectivity requirements in China, it makes doing all glass buildings they just they get really really dark. And when you look at the skyline of this, you just look here, you see that you see the shade of the tower and. One of the, and here you see that they, you know, they're dark. These are not all glass buildings, and then you have all glass buildings. And so it's not like the state where you go to Bryant Park and you look around and you see a bunch of glass buildings and they're bright and they're, they're really like look lovely and light. In China, they end up looking heavy and dark and dull. And so, the, so as an architect, we kind of got a little sick of seeing, and that's one of the reasons we did the shingled wall in ICC was to reflect the sun, right? It was purely a aesthetic decision to, to deal with the reflectivity and make the building look lighter. And so, right from the start of this project, we were instructed by the mayor, like, don't make the dark building. Mm -hmm. But then you got the planning bureau guys telling you you can't change the reflectivity of the glass. So very quickly, you, mm -hmm. you're forced into adding solidity. And uh, I think you're right. I remember we couldn't add stone above a certain height, so then it was like, we really want that much metal panel on the facade. So it was a couple of steps along the way, mm -hmm. but yeah. What's this issue, the reflectivity There's a, okay, so just to get a little technical, there's a, uh, ref, there's a, there's environmental codes, and each city in China has a different environment, or each region has a different environmental codes. So we'll say, you know, like in, some, some people have to have a reflectivity below 18% reflective, some people below 15, some people, like in Hong Kong, it's 35%. I, I don't know that it exists in America, I'm not sure, but in China and Southeast Asia, it exists. So, the lo typically, the lower the percentage of reflectivity, the more dark the glass gets because it's not reflecting the sun. So you see, like, this building has a, high, has a higher reflectivity than this building. Just, you can just tell because of, the, because of the lightness of the glass, it's just reflecting more of the sunlight, which makes it appear brighter. So when you, when you have a low reflectivity, like, I couldn't build ICC in Guangzhou 
because the glass is just too reflective, it doesn't meet the code. So very quickly, our glass is actually a similar color to this glass. It's just because we have the terracotta, it ends up looking a lot brighter because, it, because it's like white next to black instead of black. And so that was something, something we're definitely aware of in our practice in Shenzhen, something that's driving us crazy in Beijing. And in Guangzhou, we, we try to get ahead of the issue a little bit. So that other tower was prior to the code being adjusted? This like, one probably, yeah, this one probably was. Yeah. Or it just has more metal or, I think in this case, this is this, it's actually it's a very nice building by Adis. It, it kind of um, goes like that, so maybe it's reflecting the sky more or something, I, I'm not sure. But I, I remember we looked at it because we were like, the mayor was like, make it look like that building. And you're like, well, I can't because <laughs> this, you know, you've got reflectivity issues. So um, it's, like, it's definitely like a thing. And one of the reasons you go around China, like the Chinese urban patterns are totally derived from their codes. You know, the building spacing, the dark glass buildings, it's all code related. It's not like a bunch of architects getting in a room deciding to make challenged buildings. It's, it's code related. What was the foundation system? Oh my god, are you an engineer? Uh, no? no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there, it's, piles, I would assume. Yes, piles. Uh, and I think there's five levels of the six level of basement. Um, mostly parking. There's two levels of retail, which are pancake, and then I think four levels of the parking. Um, yeah, I, I, it's that's another challenge is, is when you're building like this much urban piece of urbanism at one time, the phasing of how you do the basements was, was a challenge. And I remember one of the things, one of the reasons to start, to start uh, excavating very quickly was because the building next to us was, otherwise they would get to go, they would get the green light first. And in China we have that problem a lot, like you have four sites and each developer is trying, is like rushing to get into the ground before the other one. And so that was definitely an issue here. Well, we really got into the mud with that yeah. last, last one, so it seems like a, a great opportunity to, um, to thank for it and to, if you have an additional question or want to join us over here for a glass of wine or mm -hmm. salsa or something like that, um, to ask there more informally and to um, thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks. And thank uh, thanks for your questions and your interest. Come yeah. back next, next time. Actually, our next, our next talk is going to be um, um, Jay Berman of Paycop Freed in January. If we don't, if we don't insert a December one in between, but um, on uh, the Mumbai Project World One, so 118 story t uh, tower uh, in, in Mumbai, re all residential. Okay, so thanks for coming. Thank you.